What's going on guys, this is Rob and we are back with Avengers Twilight and the Fall of Iron Man. This is how Iron Man bit the bullet, basically. But as we covered in the last video and as always, if you need to get caught up, there will be a link to the playlist at the end of this video. The Avengers have all come out of retirement because basically superheroes were banned after the events of H-Day, which we still don't have the details of what that was, although we'll find out in time. The important thing here is that Captain America is fighting Tony Stark's son, James. Now, James, despite being one of the people that's kind of running the show here, which is to say Stark Industries controlling the presidency, which in turn is controlling the government and every facet of it, James had never fought anyone like Captain America before. Because with the entire country kind of under his thumb, the idea of dissidents, people who would rise up and stand against the control of Stark Industries and James and his assistant Jarvis, which you guys called it in the last video because I missed a comma. We'll talk about that here in a minute. <laughs> right? Because there was just so much control here, anybody who was a revolutionary was immediately rounded up, either by the government's own variation of the Avengers, which we cover them because they're amazing in this video, or they were rounded up by the cops. But either way, they were just tossed into internment camps, prisons, whatever you want to call them, never to be seen or heard from again, literally black bagged and gone forever. And so because of this, James is painfully underestimating what Captain America is capable of, so much so that Captain America almost beats him to death. Right? It's crazy how that happens. Steve Rogers has to hold himself back. The other part of this, though, is that a third party's been called in, or at least backup forces have been called in, and they start firing missiles off at the raft. Because this whole fight takes place here, and it's one of the things to keep in mind. The raft used to be a prison for supervillains, but under the control of Stark Industries and the government, it's been turned into a place where they experiment on superheroes. The Venom symbiote taking away the arms or the tentacles of Dr. Octopus, using those instead, learning how they work, all that kind of stuff. But most superheroes are dead, right? Captured, killed, imprisoned, whatever the case happens to be. And so because of this, Captain America tasks Thor, right? The newly returned Thor, to basically take out these, you know, jets, which Thor does. I mean, it's child's play. Ironically enough, what's kind of funny about this is one of these guys that's flying this jet actually has Spider-Man's logo on his head, which really seems to be more mocking superheroes than anything else. But the fact is that James essentially bails out, right? He takes off realizing that he's just overwhelmed here. He can't take on everybody at the same time. He doesn't have the fighting capability of Tony Stark. He doesn't have Tony Stark's mind. He's just the son of Stark. And we'll talk again about Tony Stark here in a second because we actually learn more about him and the fall and everything. And so what is up going on is that all these different people, both prison guards and innocents who all just kind of happen to be here, scientists and whatnot, they are all brought to Captain America's underground, where they're all basically tended to by Rosa, right, who seemingly was the wife of Captain America, and she was pissed off because he didn't tell her that he was going to go back and fight and that kind of a thing, and it's kind of a cool little dynamic. But the fact is, the traditional underground, which is to say these revolutionaries that initially started all this alongside Captain America, are none too happy to see these prison guards here, because they're the enemy, Right? Like these prison guards are the ones that are like quelling anybody who is a revolutionary. So you're literally taking mortal enemies, throwing them in the same place and asking these revolutionaries to tend to their mortal enemies. But one of the points that Rosa makes here, right? When somebody brings this up is she says, that's just the nature of Captain America. He believes that every life is worth saving. And notice this, that everyone can lose their way, but be brought back into the light. Sometimes it's frustrating, but when you hear him say it, when you see him act on it, well, it can really make you believe for a moment in heroes. Now, that's an important distinction to understand here. The Stanley Milgram shock study, Philip Zimbardo's Stanford experiment, these are all experiments that have been performed here in the real world that show how easy it is to condition a person. And so for 10 years, a decade, the United States has been ruled in this way, where there are the good guys and the bad guys. And the good guys do good things, and the bad guys do bad things. On the surface, it sounds pretty straightforward, but that's operating under the assumption that the good guys are actually good guys, and the bad guys are actually bad guys. But what happens when you have a society that's been conditioned for 10 years to believe that the good guys 
are actually the bad guys. And that's what you're looking at here, right? That's how easy it is to control a society, especially when you're talking about controlling the news and the things that people see. And so what gets nuts here is that you have this kind of moment where we find out why Thor hadn't appeared. And it's not overly important to the story, but it is cool here in the context because one of the things that Thor talks about is immortality, that for him, it's been moments, right? Drops of water in what is otherwise this incredibly vast ocean of life that he leads. And so for him, the idea of watching the people that he knows and care about growing old was something that he just simply couldn't handle. So he ultimately just took off and went back to Asgard. And there is a shame that he feels in that, right? Leaving the differing superheroes to their fate. And so it kind of seems to be one of those fallout elements that came from H-Day, right? Him just kind of walking away. But the fact is that like he's here when they need him. And that's really what's the most important. But focusing back on Tony Stark, right? Kind of the meat and potatoes behind this story, that what we do is we pick up with basically the head of Tony. And that's one of the things that I want to specify here. Tony Stark does have a story about how he seemingly fell, but all we've really seen with Tony up to this point is that he was kind of kept alive artificially by his son James, who would use the intelligence of Tony for his own ends to build Iron Man suits or to decide what to invest in or how to run Stark Industries and so on. But that was basically it, right? The kicker about this is that what Tony Stark reveals to all of the Avengers is he says he saw everything, right? Even though he couldn't actually act, he was more in a catatonic tonic state than anything else, that he was able to more or less understand everything going on around him. And that where Captain America approaches this from the perspective of saying, well, it's not your fault that James has fallen to fascism and that he's been twisted and screwed up, right? You know, the end of the day, the response of Stark is, it's much worse than that, right? The Red Skull is pretending to be Jarvis, and he's the one that's actually running Stark Industries and the one that's guarding James. Now, yes, that was revealed in the last video that we did. I missed it because of a comma. Literally a comma. Sentence pauses. <laughs> Punctuation. Because it matters. <laughs> so here's the thing. The fact that Tony Stark is giving this revelation, one, shows he probably knows more than he does. And two, it now gives them a target because it's completely different when you're talking about some nebulous gathering together of these unidentified governmental agencies or individuals who are secretly pulling the strings and you can't put a name or a face to it. But being able to say that it's the Red Skull and that his motivation is to effectively seize control of the US military and make himself a dictator of the United States, well, now it's an easy target. Now they know exactly who to go after in order to end this whole thing. The other cool thing that comes into play is you also have this new Hawkeye who speaks up. And what's said here is that the differing campaigns of the US military over this kind of 10 year period has largely been one of like a imperialism, if you want to call it that, right? Traveling from one country to the next, giving it quote unquote freedom, when in reality, they just kind of make it proxies, right? Extensions of the US. And she says, I've been on a lot of missions all around the world, fighting in countries ruled by dictators. They all had the same thing in common. They wanted the world to know they did this, right? That they were men with irrational egos, egos that needed history books to underline their name in red. And so that's when you go into the explanation about Stark. And the reason for this is because when they ask the question, what happened with all of this, right? The response of Tony Stark is like, the only things I really remember is that we stopped Ultron and we stopped the Hulk, but there were still a whole bunch of Ultron enhanced villains that were on a rampage and heroes were dying all over the place. And he says, I knew what was coming next, only a fool could not have read the buildup over the years. America had had enough. I watched as they sent everything at what remained of Boston, not just the villains, but at us. The people were taking back their lives, their security, and mistook the firefighters for the fire. Janet Van Dyne and I managed to escape Boston, but we couldn't leave without James because James is the child of Tony Stark and Janet Van Dyne. And he says, I remember I had a plan and then I just had pain, where literally his body was seemingly blown apart. And he says, I don't know how they saw me coming, 
but they did. And he's like, I don't know what happened to Janet Van Dyne. I wish I could, but maybe it was so terrible that like I'm blocking it out. Maybe she's also a frozen head somewhere staring at her son as he careens towards fascism. But the response of Captain America, once they have Tony Stark and a kind of makeshift Avengers body is, okay, we can at least try to find out what that is. And that's when you get a broadcast from these new Avengers that exist, right? The first time we've seen them in this comic. And what we end up having are these Avengers that are broadcasting out to the world saying, those individuals who committed this atrocity here on the raft, right? Who went after all these innocent scientists and these soldiers who were standing up for America's freedom, right? This is obviously propaganda and all that kind of stuff. They will be brought to justice, right? And so the cool thing is you switch over to Jarvis meeting with James. And that's where he makes the reveal, right? Where literally Jarvis talks to James about what's going on in the world. And he talks about how they've brought safety and security to the world. Sure, it required people to give up their freedoms, but at the end of the day, they did it willingly. So they have nobody to blame but themselves if they don't like their lot. But the reality here is they've brought safety and security to the world. They brought safety and security to the United States and that this will extend to their absolute control over the United States. But one of the things to know here is that even when he starts to reveal his face, right, and showing that he's the Red Skull, James is left kind of uncertain because James is now being told that he's been guided this entire time by one of the most notorious and sadistic villains in the history of Marvel Comics. It's no small thing. But in response to this revelation about these new Avengers, right, and learning that they exist out there, they actually have faces, that what happens is Captain America and his secret Avengers, if we want to call them that, I always love that name in Marvel Comics, they end up traveling to Avengers Mansion. And when they get there, of course, it's a combination of Tony Stark's technology and, of course, Tyler, basically one of the revolutionaries and kind of the hacker of the group that's able to get them in. They realize that nothing here has really changed. The only difference are like the adornments, right? Just like the pictures and stuff that are put up. And that's it. There's no security systems that are built in here. No, nothing. A person could just walk in if they wanted to. And that's when they realize what's actually going on here. The Avengers, quote unquote, as they're showing up, they're hologram projections, right? The news that people see on TV, it's basically just a projection that's executed here in Avengers Mansion. They're effectively watching a show within a show. The Avengers do not exist. They haven't existed since the original Avengers all either disbanded or were killed off. And so it's just kind of like, wow, like this is how far reaching it goes. And the general public is none the wiser to what's going on. And in fact, that's the point that Red Skull makes when he pops up on a view screen, basically revealing that he's been monitoring everybody inside Avengers Mansion this entire time. And he's like, oh, they exist to the world that they keep in line, right? The whole idea behind them is illusion. Society doesn't actually need to see the Avengers in person to believe they exist. At this point, they'll believe any Thing they see on the news if the news is telling them what they want to hear. And so if what they're seeing are the Avengers on TV saying, we're going to bring these guys to justice, as far as they're concerned, the Avengers exist. And that's the beauty of all of this from the Red Skull's perspective. Through the news, he's been able to completely and totally shape society's perspective and control individual actions on the basic level. When Captain America calls him a maniac and he says, you should have prayed for them all to be real. They're the only thing that stood in the way of us stopping you. The response of the skull is what they represent is what will stop you. I've defeated you by giving your precious Americans everything they've ever wanted, prosperity through ignorance, blind eyes to the suffering of others, to America's global militaristic treachery. They believe what I tell them to believe because their cups are full. It will be resplendent to be able to finally tell them a singular truth. The Avengers of yesteryear are dead. And that's an important thing. When there's a chicken in every pot, nobody had any reason to ask questions. People just go with the flow and they accept things for how they are. But when there's 10 pots and there's one chicken, people start looking around for somebody to blame for their lack of resources, food, housing, whatever you want to call it. And that leads to them asking questions. Why are things this way? And in that question asking, they end up either intentionally or unintentionally finding themselves falling down the path of questioning the powers that be. And so with everybody being satiated, with their lives being satisfied, everybody having everything they need, essentially prosperity, 
Nobody asks any questions. So nothing ever changes. So it's really interesting, right? Because Captain America realizing this whole thing is a setup, right? It's a trap that they start closing the doors in, right? Like literally they start getting shut in one by one. Now, of course, Thor with Mjolnir, right? Good luck containing that guy. He just plows through a door, right? Just gives them all an exit. But Tony Stark stays behind in order to hack into the Skull's files and get all the information he possibly can. Now, of course, the entire Avengers mansion explodes. Tony Stark basically survives, you know, because of this point, he's just kind of a head in a giant metal suit. But what he reveals is that it's game over. The Skull already won, right? He's like, I got his plans. He's already done it. He has the U.S. military and he's going to burn down Washington. The first thing the U.S. military does under the control of the Red Skull is basically arrest the president of the United States because he's able to craft a kind of narrative to the general public that shows the president is basically a traitor. He even lies to the soldiers and tricks the soldiers into believing that the president is a traitor because at this point, the soldiers do not take their orders from the commander in chief. They take their orders from Stark Industries, right? Soldiers and the US military, they're really more akin to mercenaries these days. And they are like soldiers that swear an oath to the United States constitution above all else. And so what happens is you get this amazing speech from the Red Skull that's given to James. And he says, I've sent locations for all the Defenders safe houses. Have your units target those traitors next. The Defenders is the name of Captain America's team, but I like Secret Avengers better. And so when James asks, like, how in the world did you manage to arrest the President of the United States? The response of the Skull is, people are sheep comma, James. Others use that as a negative metaphor, but sheep are precious and beautiful, useful, but in need of guidance so they may live free away from the wolves. I control the news, but more than that, I control the news individual people see. Comforting news fills American households, but for those with a badge, with sanctioned guns and military might, they see an America where the president is a traitor, where government is an anti-democratic nightmare. You and I have been running America unofficially for almost a decade now, son. We fed the sheep so well, their happy sheep lives are because of us. So now, let us make it official. Let us take America, because Red Skull now has his own Iron Man suit and has Ultron under his thumb. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Let me know what you think down in the comments section. And as always, if you need to get caught up, make sure you click this playlist and I will catch you all later. Peace.